so this lab is consolidation test lab lab number nine and here we will be uh, studying consolidation properties of clay soils so here is uh, on the top an example of a filled situation where we may have a layer of clay uh, sandwich between sand below um, it could also be bedrock or some other soil type and there is sand above there is a groundwater table and then we are increase applying some load let's say we are going to construct a building here or um, build an embankment or we are going to put a fill so a road could be constructed and for any of these reasons there could be an additional load applied uh, which we are going to call delta sigma so uh, here is a representation of what happens on the right side um, so when we apply the load delta sigma uh, the sand has high enough permeability where the water squeezes out in the reaction and the sand settles immediately. But in clays, um, the permeability of the soil is so small that it takes a while for the water to come out. So as soon as we apply the load, or in this case, the, the weight W, which ex puts some stress on top of the soil, this clay layer can be looked at as a spring and um, water uh, um, in a chamber with a very small opening. So as soon as we apply the load, um, the load is taken by the water because the water cannot escape that quickly. And then with time, the water slowly drains out and in reaction to the applied load, the soil settles. So if the original thickness of the soil layer was H0, under the load, it's going to settle to some new height and the settlement is going to be delta H, okay? So delta H is the settlement in reaction to the applied load W or equivalent stress delta sigma. And we want to figure out how much that settlement is going to be. And one can imagine the higher the load, the settlement is going to be increasing some. And the second thing we want to find out is how long it's going to take. So we want to find out how long is, how much is the settlement and how long will it take for the soil to settle. Okay? So for the first part, we need three parameters, compression index, recompression index, and pre-consolidation stress. And for how long, we are going to determine a soil parameter called coefficient of consolidation. So imagine that we uh, drill a hole in this ground and retrieved a small soil uh, shell bit tube or a soil, in a soil sampler and brought it to the lab. And you will see in the lab video how a sample could be extracted. So we take a small sample, which is in relatively undisturbed state, and that goes here. Okay, so this is an apparatus where we have a ring that restricts the horizontal expansion of the soil sample so under the applied load from the top okay uh, this force p so the load p divided by the cross-sectional area of the soil sample will give us the stress that we apply to the sample and because of this ring on either side of the sample or the ring um, holds the sample the sample cannot expand in a horizontal direction. So the only way it can compress is in the vertical direction. And that's why it is called as one dimensional consolidation test, okay? Which represents this schematic on the top where we are applying some vertical stress uniformly across a soil layer that's uniform and extend infinitely on both sides. 
and in this case also the soil is going to settle only in the vertical direction. So the idea here is to um, change sigma, um, the applied stress and keep track of the settlement and for that we use a transducer which is a displacement transducer. So we know the original height of the specimen, the soil specimen, and with the in, up, application on each incremental stress, we find out how much is the change in the specimen height and use that information to find the soil parameters that we are going to find. So um, we can imagine um, so the way we are going to do this stress is that sigma is going to be 15 kPa um, let me get the numbers So the load sequence we are going to get is 15 kPa, 30, 60, 120, 240, and 480. So this is going to be loading. Then we are going to unload to 120 kPa and then reload to 240, 480, 1000 and 2000 kPa. So imagine that we have a soil specimen, cylindrical soil specimen. It's going to be about 2.5 inches in diameter and one inch in thickness. Okay. Which can only settle in the vertical direction. So this is H T I initial sample height okay. and then this is going to have just solids which is height so height of solids and this is going to be height of voids and this is going to be mass of solids which is not going to change because the total amount of soil is always going to be the same so the only thing that is going to change with applied load is that the void space is going to become smaller and smaller okay so we are going to make use of this and uh, we are going to do the whole test and at the end of the test we are going to determine dry mass of soil specimen at the end of the test ms because that's going to be the same at the beginning of the test and we cannot disturb our samples so the best thing to do is measure it at the end of the test and we know that mass of soil is going to be equal to specific unit weight of the soil particles times the volume of solids which is specific gravity times density of water times height of solids times the cross-sectional area of the soil which is the volume of solids and that will give us H S M S A G S rho W we are going to assume this to be 2.7 for our soil this is the cross-sectional area of the soil And 
uh, your data sheet contains the diameter of the specimen so you can calculate that we know the density of water and this mass of solids is given to you um, in your data sheets so once we know this referring back to this diagram we can figure out that height of voids is initial height minus height of solids and that will give us information on initial void ratio E0 which is this value of height of voids in the beginning divided by the height of solids and this is an important number you need um, uh, to do the uh, calculations so once again let's quickly look at so we have a clay specimen sandwiched between porous stones so the water can squeeze out of it uh, of the clay specimen its initial height is going to be hti the entire specimen and it is going to have certain amount of voids and height of solids and height of solids won't change throughout the um, test so this is our initial condition okay then on this specimen we are going to apply a load that's equivalent to fifteen kPa, okay. and um, in reaction to that, it's going to settle by an amount delta H one. Okay, so its initial height was HTI. So initially it was HTI, and then it settled to uh, by uh, delta H one so the change in void ratio so we already saw how much was the initial void ratio and how to calculate that before we started applying any stresses so the change in void ratio um, is going to be delta h1 divided by hs so the new void ratio e1 is going to be E0 minus delta E1 okay. then we are going to increase the load for the stress to 30 kPa which is going to have a total change in height as delta H2 so delta E2 is going to be delta H2 divided by the height of solids so E2 can be calculated as E0 minus delta E2 okay? so we do that for all load increments and we get a relationship between Sigma which is the applied stress and void ratio Okay, so this is applied stress and versus void ratio so um, we have loading sequence um, of 15 30 60 120 40 and 480 kpa then we unload and then reload again so during each of the load increment we keep track of change in sample height as a function of time and we are going to use that information to find the coefficient of consolidation but in this particular table down below for each normal stress we have the settlement that took place at the end of the loading so what happens that once you apply 15 kPa, uh, you start making uh, recordings 
at 15 seconds, 30 seconds, one minute, two minute, all the way to 24 hours. That's how a consolidation test used to be done. So if you had like 10 loading stages, uh, as we are doing here, uh, the test will go on for 20, uh, 10 days. But now with automated process, the program itself uh, keep track of change in settlement. And if the settlement is not appreciably changing, then it automatically goes on to the next loading stage. Um, and when that happens, we record the final settlement before the loading is changed. So this particular table we are seeing here gives us the loading, um, the settlement at, at the end of each loading stage. So using this information, we calculate the, spec the specimen height at the end of the load increment. Uh, the height of solids is not changing. We find the height of voids and keep track of the void ratio. So for each load increment at the end of it, we'll have a new void ratio. So we plot that void ratio versus the normal stress. So here I have an example. The normal stress is in PSI. Um, in um, your um, te uh, test, uh, those are in KPA, but here I'm picking an example where they are in PSI, and the void ratio is on y-axis. So the data point will look like these. So we use by hand or by computer, we can draw a curve passing through that. So this is 15, 30, 60 kPa and so on. Here it's in PSI. Then we unload, reload, and then we start loading again. Okay. So loading, unloading is done so that we can obtain recompression index, which is essentially that curve is parallel to this part. But sometimes at low stresses in the test, we don't get good data in that range. And that's why loading, unloading here is useful. And then this passes the pre-consolidation stress at some point. And this is called virgin compression curve. Which is after... Um, the pre-consolidation stress is passed. So we are going to use this data to find compression index and recompression index. And if you see, the equations are the same for both of them, which are essentially the slopes of line, which is the change in void ratio divided by log change in stress. So for compression index, we pick any two points on this curve and find the slope. And this is called C sub C, or the compression index. And we do similar thing here on this line, we find the slope of that line, and that is a recompression index. Then I have replotted the data here in order to um, um, show how the pre-consolidation stress um, uh, could be determined. So pre-consolidation stress um, sigma prime c is or sometimes it's referred to as sigma prime p is the stress the soil specimen has experienced um, when it was in the ground um, uh, in the past, the maximum stress uh, it has experienced in the past. So imagine that uh, if we have um, a soil layer that's settled under its own weight, the pre-consolidation stress is going to be the overburden stress at that depth where the sample came from. But there could have been an iceberg sitting at that location um, thousands of years ago. In that case, it has seen higher stresses in the past than the current stresses. Or there could have been a multi-story building that's now removed. And that's another example where there could be high pre-consolidation stress. So if the soil has been subjected to pre-consolidation stress, we see that initial slope 
changes and uh, then it passes the consolidation stress and it becomes steeper. So in order to find the pre-consolidation stress, it is uh, important to uh, find a point of maximum curvature. So in this case, it is a point of maximum curvature, or if you attempt to draw a circle at this point where this part being a tangent, you can draw the smallest circle at that location. So I'm going to pick this point as the point of maximum curvature and draw a horizontal and then we are going to draw a tangent and then draw a bisector such that this angle is same as that angle and then we are going to take um, this part of the curve which is the compression curve and extend it backwards and wherever that intersects we are going to draw find that stress to be the pre-consolidation stress so in this case it is going to be 20, 30, 40 PSI is going to be the pre-consolidation stress, okay? So you will be doing this kind of a construction, um, the originally suggested by a researcher called Casagrande, um, and uh, you will find a pre-consolidation stress, compression index, and this slope as a recompression index. So these three properties will come out of the data so far. Then we move on to coefficient of consolidation, uh, which is, which uses the equation TV, which is, um, can be found from a table, uh, time factor, times the coefficient of consolidation CV, time, divided by the sample height square and this actually oftentimes has a subscript dr which is uh, uh, distance of drainage path so if we have our specimen okay of a certain thickness you know that it can't expand in the horizontal direction and only way it can change its height is in the vertical direction. The height of drainage path is half the specimen height because we have porous stones on both sides. The maximum drainage path that a soil a water particle is going to have here in the middle is either going up or going down and it's half the thickness. Um, so that's one thing to remember and we are going to use two methods. One is called square root of time method and another one is logarithm of time method. So here is an example. So in your data sheet, I took the data from 1000 KPA. So uh, this is what I was talking about. As soon as the load of 1000 KPA or the stress of 1000 KPA was applied, you start making measurements at 0 minutes, 0.1 minutes, 0.25 minutes, 0.5 minutes, and so on. And... Um, in this particular case, the program went on to the next loading increment of 2000 kPa after 25 minutes. Okay, So you convert, use the displacement and find a sample height. So you will have that column here. And then square root of time. So essentially 4 
is becomes 2 square root of 4 minutes is 2 uh, 16 is 4 and so on 25 will be 5 right okay so you have that axis square root of time which is which is presented on the x-axis um, so this is square root of time and specimen height is on the y-axis so again we draw a curve through the data points okay? and the way to do it is we extend the initial straight line portion to the back and wherever that intersects we draw a line that has a slope of 1.15 times the slope of this line okay so the way to do it is maybe the easiest thing is to extend it all the way to the bottom measure this physical distance let's say it is three centimeters then you draw a point that's 1.15 times 3 which is 3.45 obviously I didn't draw this well so I'm going to delete this and say 3 point uh, so this one uh, okay if I extend it to be precise it looks uh, if I measure this physical distance um, it's let's say um, this physical distance is three centimeters so 1.15 times 3 becomes 3.45 so I measure that which comes out here let's say and we draw this line to this point again and wherever that intersects the curve that number in this particular case it's about 2.8 and that corresponds to 90% consolidation. Okay, so T90 square root of R comes out to be in this particular example 2.8. Um, so T90 will be. 7.84 minutes okay and then we use the equation which is tv is equal to cv t90 divided by h square hdr so tv for 90 percent consolidation is 0.848 cv we want to find out T90 in this case is 7.84 minutes and then HDR is the average sample height okay so this is average sample height so you have the first number here and the last number here and you find that as an um, and you find the average of the two that gives you average sample height and HDR will be divided by 2 and that gives you HDR okay so average sample height divided by 2 okay. and that's how you find CV and I'm asking that you report it in meter square per year. So you have to change all your dimensions, uh, all the units at the end and convert it into meter square per year. So you can um, compare it with um, uh, typical values. Finally, the second method to use is square root of time method. So again, you have time elapsed in minute and displacement. Using displacement, you calculate specimen height or sample height in millimeters. 
and again I'm using 1000 kPa data. So for this the sample height is plotted in millimeters on the y-axis and you um, um, calculate the logarithm of time in minutes. Um, um, so you convert the time elapsed um, and take a logarithm of that. So we are going to join these points. Okay. Then we are going to pick up any time um, in the initial flat portion. Okay, T1. And multiplied by four times and tie four T1. So if this was point two, this will be point eight. So we take that up here and whatever this vertical distance is, we uh, add that much on top and that gives us our initial reading at zero so once we determine what this point is I lost my curve we take this straight line portion and extend it back we take this straight line portion at the end and extend it back and that comes out to be we call it 100% consolidation and then we find midpoint of this point and that point somewhere here looks like and we find this so you read it on your log scale and looks like this is about 2.6 okay so you our t50 for 50% 50 consolidation is going to be 2.6 minutes Okay, so again the equation will be, we want to find CV, T50 in this case is going to be 2.6 minutes, HDR, we calculate it again as the average sample height divided by 2 and TV for 50% consolidation it 0.197. And that's how you calculate CV. Once again, report it in meter square per year.